and welcome to this lesson, Talkin' Blues. We're gonna talk about fills today. What I was just playing was a bunch of little short phrases, and that's the essence of what a fill is. And, and just to give you a more context, a fill is like a conversation that you have with the vocalist in a typical blues arrangement. And when we talk about arranging parts on a blues, you know, the, the most common place that you start when you say, well, what do I play while the singer's singing? Of course, you start with the, the standard rhythm parts. If we're doing a shuffle, then you know that you've got the, the boogie, you know. And you've got all the, all the standard chord parts and little rhythmic patterns and so on that everybody uses all the time. But a part that is often overlooked, even though it's part of the fabric of blues, the, the essence of blues, which is call and response, the, this conversational quality that's always happening on different levels within the band, between the band and the audience is just, just part of the style. Uh, this missing link is the fill. In other words, it's the answer to the vocal. The vocal says something and then the instrument answers it. Now this can be in the form of, of an arranged fill where like a horn section might play, you know, mm -hmm. you know, something that's very set and, and very much the same each time or often it's an improvised fill. So the, the vocalist sings a line and then the guitar player or the saxophone, whoever, comes back and says, oh yeah, you know, in, which in musical terms would be, oh yeah, you know what I'm saying? So it's just a couple of notes. Now, the, the concept of fills is pretty easy. Uh, everybody understands it, you've heard it a million times. My observation has been in watching guitar players who are learning to play blues and learning to play blues in a band, is that applying fills, knowing what to play and when to play it, is actually a lot trickier. Now there's no mystery to it, but you have to think a little bit differently than you might think if you're playing or, or concentrating mainly on playing solos, because a solo, 12 bar solo, that gives you a lot of room and you can stretch out and play longer phrases, but a fill often has to be as, as short as literally one note. Now the three ingredients that essentially make up any phrase, you've got notes, you've got rhythm, and then you've got this other thing, the third dimension I think of it as, which is touch or articulation. It's how you play the notes, how you make them come alive. And these are techniques like vibrato or sliding into the note or how you use your, your, your picking attack and so forth. It's all the personality that goes into a phrase and in the end that's what makes you sound like you when you're playing. So when you play fills and you've only got a couple of notes to play with, touch, becomes the most prominent ingredient because that's really what's going to make it stick. A great example, by the way, if you're familiar with this at all, before the world ever heard of Stevie Ray Vaughan, he was a guitar player on David Bowie's record, Let's Dance, a very you know, popular record in the early 80s. And nobody heard of Stevie Ray Vaughan, but there was a guy on the, on the record playing these fills. You know, literally these one note, two note, three note fills, and it was like everybody was, was hearing that and saying, wow, who's that, you know? So that's how important it is, and that's how much personality you can convey in just a few notes. And if you have control of those notes and can, can put that touch on those notes, then a solo, man, that's like you feel like you got all week, you know? You can really stretch out. So um, here's how a typical blues vocal is, is built, and I'll just give you the rhythmic quality first. So let's say we're playing our 12 bar shuffle, well, one, two, three. The vocalist would come in something like this. One, two, three. Ba da ba do ba da ba do do. Ba da da ba do ba. Right. Pick any one of a thousand blues songs, and it's somewhere in that neighborhood rhythmically. So you have the opening half of the first phrase. Ba do ba da ba do ba da da. Then there's a little pause, and then the phrase is completed. Ba da do ba do ba. Then there's a longer pause. It's almost two bars. So this is where the call and response thing starts to happen. The vocalist sings the first line. The very short fill in the middle is just like a little comment, like, uh-huh. And then the vocalist finishes the line. And then you have a longer fill that occupies the next two bars. So to become adept at playing fills, what you need is a vocabulary of phrases that range from one note up to about two bars. And these are ideas that, that you want to practice, you want to memorize, and really nail them down tight 
so that when it comes time to play and the vocalist is phrasing one way or another, you can listen and respond instantly and have just the right amount of notes and, and feel to plug in there. All right. Now I'm going to show you some examples of, uh, of typical short fills. And there's no difference between a fill and a lick. It's just a lick placed in a certain specific context. But because the context is so limited, you have to pay attention to every detail, okay? So starting with the first idea, and I'll put these all together over a rhythm track. The first idea is a one note fill. You say, well, how can one note be a lick? Well, it can because three ingredients, you got note, you got rhythm, and you've got touch. And in a one note fill, you, you know what the melody is. The rhythm is wherever you place it in the bar. That depends on where the vocalist is singing. Touch is what makes it happen. So in this case, I play that one note. It's really two. It starts on G, and I slide up into the A, but the G is almost non-existent. So it's just kind of a setup and then a quick delivery. Now, the other little trick there is in my right hand, I'm using my bare finger, so I pop the note. And then when I finish the, the, the slide, I add vibrato. So I've actually added quite a bit of personality to that note. So even though it's, it's essentially one note, it's got three dimensions happening all at the same time. As I start to expand my fill vocabulary and make the notes or the fills a little bit longer, I don't want to lose that intimate quality, but I want to continue adding it as more and more notes and, and more complex rhythms enter the picture. Okay, now figure one in your lesson is basically a series of fills. And there, as, as I said, there's nothing special about these. These are not unique. They're just typical examples of short phrases that fit effectively against a rhythm pattern and can be plugged in essentially anywhere you need them. Okay, so let's, let's uh, go through those. I'll play them for you and then we'll talk a little bit more. Okay, here we go. So I started with one note and I gradually expanded it and the last couple of fills would be the sort of the length that would occupy that, that gap in between the lines of the vocal, almost two bars in length. Now the best way to develop a real fill vocabulary, vocabulary other than this kind of stuff here is to listen obviously to great blues records and the guys who know how to play fills and I would start with the three kings, B.B., Albert and Freddie all masters, and it's no coincidence that they were all great singers. And so they would fill for themselves, and the fills that they played on their guitar were matched to the vocal quality. It had the same kind of vibe, and it came from the same direction. So a natural fit, that's what you're looking for. And when you're playing behind another singer, that's the tricky part, is you're trying to sort of carry on this conversation and figure out what's the song about, What's the singer's style like? Are they aggressive and powerful, or are they kind of laid back and, and quiet? How can you complement their vocals and not ride over top of them or, or sort of get into a competition with them? So it's basically a lot of experience, a lot of playing, a lot of listening, but over time you develop this, uh, this sense of where to place those notes, and it can happen very naturally after a while. It, you don't have to think about it too hard. Now, I've got a little, a little blues tune here for you. Uh, typical theme, guy with a broken heart, what are you going to say, you know, got to play the blues. But I'll show you just typically how, uh, how a vocal might be arranged rhythmically and then how the fills would fit around it. So I'm playing fills for myself and, and inherently I know where the break is going to be and I can pop my little fill in there. If I'm playing behind someone else, I have to stop, listen and always be conscious of where the singer is. A good singer will back away from the mic. And, and give you a visual reference, but often they'll be right up on it. You just have to listen and use your judgment, okay? So let's try this little thing on for size. This is uh, figure two, all right? Check it out. 
Well, my baby gone and left me. She left me with a broken heart. Yes, my baby gone and left me. She left me with a broken heart. I wanna rock away from here. But now my car won't even start. And so my little tale of woe will continue indefinitely. But you get the idea. You know, ba da ba do ba do ba blang, ba da ba do ba do boo da boo, ba ba do boo, ba ba do boo, right? Now, as I'm vocalizing here, what I'm thinking in my mind is the first part of the phrase that I'm singing is the vocal, and then the fill is like this little comment, right? Very simple. The idea is very simple. But as I said, the application is something that takes a lot of practice. So you're just going to have to listen, and mainly, you just got to get out and play. And once you do that, it all comes together, sounds cool, and you have a ball. Okay? I'll see you the next time. Thanks a lot.